Hello and welcome to the 2023 speaker series for Autoimmune Encephalitis Awareness Month. My name is Tabitha Orth and I'm president and founder of the International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society and will be your hostess throughout the series. Um, today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Owen Flanagan with us. He's an associate professor of neurology and consultant in the departments of neurology and laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. His clinical expertise and research is focused on the diagnosis and management of autoimmune neurological disorders with an emphasis on inflammatory autoimmune spinal cord disorders and their mimics, including uh, MRI patterns. And today he's going to be talking to us about um, a paper that he recently with colleagues uh, published on autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis uh, in adults. And we'll go over diagnosis and misdiagnosis. And at the end of his presentation, we will have a, a question and answer period. So as questions arise during the talk, you can uh, type them into the Q&A box below. And um, you do want to make sure that if you're asking a question because you are a family member or a patient, that the question is not specific to your case, but a general question. And uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Flanagan. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Flanagan. Oh, thanks so much, Tab uh, Tabitha, for the opportunity to be with you today and, and talk on this topic to uh, all of the patients and families out there um, to try and uh, get into a, a little bit of detail about autoimmune encephalitis, both diagnosis and misdiagnosis and what that might mean for patients and how we can help patients better. Because uh, the bottom line is we want to, the, the goal of all of this is so we can help our patients. So um, uh, this is my talk title. Um, the learning objectives are to recognize autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis as an important issue. We'll talk about some red flags that might suggest that there might be something else going on. And we'll highlight some of the antibody results that can be a bit more problematic and are not as uh, specific as some of the other antibody results. So we'll go over some of that. Okay, these are some of my disclosures, which is not really too relevant to this talk, which will focus mostly on diagnosis. So if we think back of the history of autoimmune encephalitis in 1966, Lord Brain, uh, reported a patient with delirium and stroke-like episodes who had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a, an autoimmune thyroid disease. And the patient didn't respond right away to prednisone, but eventually improved. And he felt that autoimmune mechanisms may be at play. And this brought up this link of the thyroid uh, issues that we'll come back to later to autoimmune encephalitis. And, and the term uh, that came up from this was Hashimoto's encephalopathy, or another term called steroid responsive encephalopathy associated with autoimmune thyroiditis. So this was kind of some of the background, but we've really learned a lot more um, in recent years. And indeed, if we look at how many new antibodies have been discovered over time, if we uh, focus in on 1960 here, we can see we had very few antibodies for autoimmune neurologic disease, maybe striated muscle antibody. And then uh, some other antibodies came, one called anti-HU or ANA1 antibodies came in the 1960s. And what you'll see here is that there was a huge explosion in the late 2000s of new antibodies discovered. And much of this uh, began with the NMDA receptor antibody, which was discovered by Professor Joseph Dalmau, who's uh, currently in Barcelona. And this led to his group producing, um, uh, describing and uh, discovering many new different antibodies that you can see outlined here. And indeed, many other groups, including here at Mayo Clinic, we've discovered a number of different antibodies that are outlined um, here. And these antibodies can be divided into ones that bind to uh, proteins within the cell called intracellular or cytoplasmic proteins, and ones that bind to the surface of the cell. And the ones that bind to the surface of the cell tend to respond a bit better to immunotherapy, to treatment. 
Um, we did a study uh, in Olmstead County here, which is our county where Mayo Clinic is located in Minnesota. And what we found was that over time, autoimmune encephalitis diagnosis was becoming more frequent. And indeed, autoimmune encephalitis was similar to infectious encephalitis um, overall. And the increase over time was due to these new antibodies being discovered. So what this means is that we're getting better at picking up cases of autoimmune encephalitis. And now we can diagnose and treat these patients. While previously, they may have been told they had an infection or they had an unknown cause for their encephalitis. So this has been um, uh, really useful to be able to use these antibody markers to make the diagnosis in these patients. Uh, when we do try and diagnose autoimmune encephalitis, some of the tests that many of the patients in the audience or family members will know that their uh, family members underwent would include an MRI of the brain. And here we can see these white matter changes here, or sometimes we can see swelling on one side of the brain with the MOG antibodies here or in the, in the, what we call the posterior fossa, in the brainstem and the cerebellum here, we can see signal abnormalities. Here we can see abnormalities in what we call the temporal lobe, the mesial temporal lobe. This is the memory part of the brain. So patients with this kind of limbic encephalitis often have trouble with memory. And then we can see other areas of the brain involved. This is called the basal ganglia that controls your movements. And sometimes patients can get too much movement, what we call a hyperkinetic movement disorder or too little movement. We can also see um, involvement of the deep part of the brain here. This is the area that controls sleep. So some patients can have trouble where they're too sleepy or other patients will have trouble where they're, uh, they have insomnia and they're not able to sleep. There's other markers here. Sometimes we can see something called um, gadolinium enhancement, which is a marker of inflammation. When they give, when you go for your MRI brain, they will put in contrast and we can sometimes see contrast enhancement like is shown here. And then other times the MRI of the brain may be completely normal. For example, with NMDA receptor antibodies, the MRI of the brain is often normal in most cases. And this can cause confusion because when uh, neurologists see patients who we think have encephalitis, we always ex expect that the brain MRI will show abnormalities, but that's not always the case. So the antibodies are useful in their own right too, even when the MRI is normal. Uh, we often will do electrical tests in autoimmune encephalitis, so we can do an EEG to look for, uh, what we look for is here for sparks or uh, what we call sharp waves, spikes, or small little seizures. And these sharp waves and spikes can suggest that a patient is predisposed to seizure. So we're kind of looking for sparks. And if we think of a seizure as a fire, we're looking for sparks in between those seizures that might suggest uh, seizures are there. O oftentimes the EEG in patients who have encephalitis or encephalopathy is abnormal and usually will slow slowing of the brain. So the brain is not working quite as fast and we often see slow waves in the brain. And um, sometimes the EEG can be normal even when a patient is having a seizure. There's something called facio-brachial dystonic seizures where the EEG doesn't usually show much, but these are very characteristic and associated with LGI-1 antibodies. And then sometimes there can be a pattern on the EEG that may tell us exactly what type of encephalitis, autoimmune encephalitis it is, like the extreme delta brush with NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, as part of our workup for autoimmune encephalitis, we'll often do a spinal fluid analysis. And this is to look for evidence of an increased white blood cell count. So just like when you have an infection in your body and your white blood cell count will ra rise in your blood, and that's how a doctor will help detect if you've got an underlying infection, the white blood cell count elevation in the spinal fluid, it's similar. We have a normal range of zero to five. And if there's elevations in white blood cell count, that might suggest that there's some ongoing either inflammation inflammation or infection. We can also check for antibodies within the spinal fluid and there's a generic way to test for this where we look for something called oligoclonal bands. We see these commonly in multiple sclerosis, but we can also see them in autoimmune conditions. We can also take advantage that the spinal fluid allows us to look at other things within the central nervous system. So we can look for different vi viruses like herpes virus. We can even look for markers of CJD. Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which can cause a rapidly progressive dementia and mimic autoimmune encephalitis. And we can do next generation sequencing looking for particular types of infections. We can also look at the cells in the spinal fluid to look for any cancer cells, for example, for lymphoma. 
And we can also look for markers of uh, degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease, where we look for amyloid beta or tau proteins within the spinal fluid that can give us a clue to those part particular uh, causes. And then um, we'll often do antibody testing both in blood and spinal fluid. So this is how we, uh, this is part of uh, the diagnostic testing that we undergo to make a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And I'll focus in later more on about misdiagnosis and how that happens. And um, just as a caveat, sometimes uh, patients may not have much evidence of inflammation, but still have autoimmune encephalitis. And that's why testing the antibodies is so important. So testing for LGI-1, AMPA receptor antibodies, IGLAN-5 and NMDA. Some of those patients won't have much inflammation on their spinal fluid, but it's still important to test the antibodies if the case is suspicious. For example, if it's a rapidly progressive type uh, dementia. So how do we do the neural antibody testing? Well, one of the mainstays is something that we call tissue immunofluorescence testing. And this involves running the patient's blood or spinal fluid on a mouse tissue or rodent tissue. And what we look is we look for staining within the mouse brain that suggests that there might be an autoantibody. And it, believe it or not, the mouse brain and the human brain are quite similar. So if we see lots of staining on a mouse brain, then this suggests that this antibody in the person's body may be binding to their own brain tissue and causing an issue. And uh, this is how we uh, do our testing. We can then do confirmatory tests. So if we see a particular pattern like over here, then we can do a confirmatory test with a Western blot type test. And that can help us um, with our testing if we can confirm it in a different way that gives us kind of more specificity and makes it less likely it's going to be a false positive result. Some of the older generation techniques, we used to do something called immunoprecipitation. It's a little bit of a sticky way of doing this test. And sometimes we used to see low positives with this technique. Um, so we've moved on to different techniques. Another way of looking for antibodies is to culture neurons. So you can culture neurons or you can culture brain cells in a dish and then you would grow those brain cells and then you would add the patient's spinal fluid or serum and see if it's binding to uh, those cells in the dish. And if those cells are living, if it binds to something on the surface of those cells, then that suggests that um, there's an autoantibody. And we use something called an immunofluorescent tag to light this up so we can see nicely in green over here what lights up or here we can see in this green sparkly uh, evidence what is lighting up. We now use other techniques. There's one called a cell-based assay where we look, for example, we can put the NMDA receptor on the surface of a cell. And then we look to see if, this, if the uh, patient's blood or spinal fluid, if it's binding to that NMDA receptor on the cell compared to other cells that don't have NMDA receptor on the surface. And we can do this in different ways. There's a way to do it with live cells uh, that we sometimes call FACS or flow cytometry. So these are kind of complicated uh, um, ways of testing, but really important for making the diagnosis. Particularly, this is our mainstay, this tissue-based immunofluorescence. Uh, ELISA is another technique that we can sometimes use, but less commonly used, I would say, nowadays. So what about the diagnostic criteria for autoimmune encephalitis? Well, this was published by uh, Professor Grouse and Professor Dalmau and many other colleagues in 2016. And this ga gave a framework for the possible diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And what they had here was that they needed every patient to meet this criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis. And that acute, uh, covered a subacute onset of symptoms with memory deficits, altered mental status, or even psychiatric symptoms. As many of you know, patients can have behavioral change or psychosis as their first uh, presentation. And then patients had to have other central nervous system findings, either on examination or have seizures, for example, uh, or they had to have inflammation on their spinal fluid or MRI changes suggestive of encephalitis. And if you had these and then you needed to exclude other causes. And if you have, if you fulfill the criteria for this, then you came into this algorithm type here. So this is kind of a little bit complicated, but basically if you met the features for this, then you would go in here into this and depending on what features you had or what antibodies you had, you would fit a different category of diagnosis. And if you didn't fit any of these diagnoses, then the doctor should reconsider the diagnosis. So a little bit of a complicated algorithm here, but the bottom line is that 
patients really had to meet these criteria to be able to enter to fulfill any of the other criteria. So these were required. So what about autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis? Well, we know that autoimmune encephalitis is kind of a rare condition, although we're still identifying it more frequently. It's still quite rare compared to other causes of confusion in the population. So for example, many hospitalized patients who are in the hospital can develop confusion and disorientation just from having a urine infection, for example, if they have pneumonia, or if they have some if they're just very elderly, sometimes just being in the hospital and out of their home environment, they can become more confused. We know that patients can have psychiatric disorders like depression, which is going to be much more common than autoimmune encephalitis. Schizophrenia is gonna be more common than autoimmune encephalitis. So many of these disorders are more common. Or you can have neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease, or Lewy body disease or infections like viruses affecting the nervous system. Or some patients just have a brain fog. They may not have a full encephalopathy, but more they just report that they feel like they're in a bit of a cloud. And there are some different reasons for that that we can talk about later. And many of the studies that have been done on autoimmune encephalitis have been about those patients where initially they were taught to have something else, but in the end, they did truly have autoimmune encephalitis. But very few studies had looked the other way around and looked at patients who were suspected to have autoimmune encephalitis, but ended up having something else. And that was the focus of our study. And we would see these patients, uh, patients come into our clinic who, uh, quite commonly, who were told they had autoimmune encephalitis, but then they might have another disorder, or we might initially suspect they had autoimmune encephalitis, and then eventually they were found to have something else. So this is something we uh, see fairly frequently. And there is a risk to misdiagnosis as an autoimmune cause because many times we'll use immunosuppression and we don't wanna lower the immune system if a patient doesn't have an autoimmune encephalitis as that increases the risk of infection, particularly with COVID-19 around. And also there can be a delay in the diagnosis and the treatment of the actual disorder. So if a patient has a brain glioma, that needs to be a brain tumor, that needs to be treated quite quickly. And if we make the diagnosis that it's autoimmune and it's not, it's actually a brain tumor, then when we delay that treatment, that brain tumor may be harder to treat uh, down the line. So to embark on this study, we did an international multicenter study on autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis. We involved uh, patients who were seen at the Mayo Clinic, uh, those who were seen at Oxford University in the UK, those who were seen at the University of Utah, University of California, San Francisco, uh, UT Southwestern uh, in Texas, uh, Dallas, Texas, and Washington University in St. Louis. So these are all centers that uh, would see patients who have autoimmune encephalitis, and we're recognizing this phenomenon that some of these patients were misdiagnosed. So what we did was we looked at this study focused on adults, and we looked at patients who came to our clinic or were seen in our hospital who were initially told they had autoimmune encephalitis or either by us, we thought they had autoimmune encephalitis or somebody else in the community maybe told them they had autoimmune encephalitis. And then subsequently we gave them a different diagnosis. So that might've been that they had a brain tumor confirmed or maybe they had a psychiatric disease or some other condition. And we also collected at the same time, just to see how common this was, we collected how many were misdiagnosed versus how many had a true autoimmune encephalitis. And we collected lots of the data that we mentioned earlier, the MRI, the spinal fluid, and lots of those features. And what we had in total was 107 patients who were misdiagnosed. And this represented about a quarter of patients referred were uh, misdiagnosed. The other patients did have true autoimmune encephalitis. So what about what were the features in these patients that might give us a clue that we should think about other conditions? Well, many of these patients had a slower onset. So maybe their symptoms came on over months or years rather than coming over days or weeks like we typically see with autoimmune encephalitis. The frequency of seizures was lower than we typically see. Seizures are very common in autoimmune encephalitis and usually over half of patients or even three quarters of patients may have seizures as part of autoimmune encephalitis. We saw that the inflammation in the spinal fluid was infrequent. 80% did not have inflammation. And the MRI brain showed abnormalities in only about 18%. And some of these patients even had this detailed memory testing that was normal. 
So it's if you have autoimmune encephalitis, the memory testing is usually quite impaired. So it's unusual to have normal testing. We looked at how many fulfilled those diagnostic criteria that I mentioned, and only about a quarter of patients in our study fulfilled those criteria. So if you have a patient who doesn't meet these criteria, or you are a patient, and you look over these and these don't fit well for you, then it might be something to think, do I really have autoimmune encephalitis or could there be something else that is causing my difficulties? What were the types of conditions? Well, we found that some uh, uh, fell within the realm of something we call functional neurologic disorder, where uh, these patients have true abnormal symptoms, but it's more of a software than a hardware problem. And it's something that we treat with cognitive behavioral therapy. There were other patients who might have had depression with psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and we found that in about 18%. And then there were other patients who were on multiple medications, maybe had chronic pain, and might have brain fog or some other conditions, chronic migraine, fibromyalgia, and they had more of a brain fog. They didn't have severe confusion in that they weren't in the hospital, but they had memory difficulties, and some of it may have related to these other conditions or some of the medications that they were taking at the time. Another category of disorders that, that were misdiagnosed was uh, under the neurologic category more, which included neurodegenerative conditions. So that's things like Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, CJD. And some other patients had brain tumors, so they might have a brain tumor in the temporal lobe that looked a bit like inflammation. And then there was a variety of other conditions, um, mitochondrial type disorders. Some patients just had epilepsy uh, or other patients had nutritional deficiencies or had infections. So a broad range of different conditions that were misdiagnosed as autoimmune encephalitis. Here's some examples of some of the cases from our study. So this patient has this large area of signal abnormality here in the temporal lobe that was getting larger. And while we do see swelling with autoimmune encephalitis, this one, the swelling looked a bit more than would be expected. And this turned out to be a tumor growing larger and larger. Despite the treatment, they continue to have this large area of abnormality. This patient here had a lymphoma where we see these signal abnormalities within the brain with enhancement. This patient had HIV infection involving the white matter here. This patient had a disease of their mitochondria, which is your energy store within the brain that could sometimes look like autoimmune encephalitis. And then on the bottom here, this was a patient with Alzheimer's disease who had a lot of thinning within their memory uh, parts of the brain here. And then um, another patient here had something we called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And this patient had a PET scan here. This patient also had Alzheimer's disease. And sometimes the PET scan can help us in making that diagnosis. So what were the reasons that these patients uh, were misdiagnosed as autoimmune encephalitis? Well, a lot of times it was because there was an antibody. Some of these markers that I mentioned earlier that have really been a great breakthrough for autoimmune encephalitis, some of those we're getting better and better with our techniques over time, but some of the ones that we that were initially associated with autoimmune encephalitis are not as reliable a marker as we first thought. So that sometimes led to um, uh, autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis. This was particularly antibodies that were detected in the blood. Other times, uh, people misinterpreted uh, functional neurologic symptoms as true neurologic, or other times the imaging, you know, the MRI looked abnormal and people thought it was inflammation, but maybe it turned out to be a tumor, for example. Or other times there were psychiatric uh, disorders that was a challenge to make the diagnosis. So what were the serum antibodies that led to confusion? Well, thyroid peroxidase antibodies or TPO antibodies, these are very common in the general population. So these aren't a good marker to hang your hat on for autoimmune encephalitis. The GAD65 antibodies, also very common, about 8% of the general population, and oftentimes they're at low level. With GAD65, when it's associated with true encephalitis, the levels are usually sky high, really, really high. Uh, the potassium channel antibody, um, when that's negative for the LGI-1 and Casper-2, that's also a red flag and it's not a very good marker of autoimmune encephalitis. Or the NMDA receptor antibodies, if we detect them in our blood, but we don't detect them in spinal fluid, that's a bit unusual. And then there were some other antibodies that were detected with a variety of different techniques that um, uh, were false positive results. 
So what about what was what happened with these patients? So uh, we found that many of these patients, their delay to diagnosis was up to a year and a half later. So this led to them not getting the correct diagnosis and then a delay in treatment of that true diagnosis of up to a year and a half and even longer in some other patients. Um, and we also found, although this may not have been documented well, that many patients had side effects from this immunotherapy. So patients developed psychosis, infections, uh, patients developed um, uh, difficulties with walking, bone problems. So these immunotherapies do have risk and this can be problematic uh, in patients. And we may not have documented all of this, but many patients who've taken steroids or other treatments know that there can be a lot of side effects. Uh, and here's some of the side effects that we found in the study. So in summary, what did we find that were some of the markers that, we, that doctors and, and patients should look out for that might suggest it's not really autoimmune encephalitis? Well, if it comes on very slowly, it's less likely to be autoimmune encephalitis. Autoimmune encephalitis usually comes on very quickly and patients often present to the hospital. If there were other reasons for their memory difficulties, for example, if they're on lots of medications, if there was a, a lot of pain or insomnia, migraine, et cetera, that sometimes was a contributor. Sometimes on the neurologic examination, there can be features consistent with what we call a functional neurologic disorder that are different to autoimmune encephalitis. Um, other patients can have features of this mitochondrial, this energy store, where sometimes patients can be smaller and have hearing loss. Um, so that can sometimes be a clue. And then if they've got normal memory testing, that would be unusual. When the MRI of the brain is completely normal, we should at least think of it as a red flag. Uh, or if the brain MRI shows lots of thinning in the brain without much evidence of uh, what we call signal abnormalities or enhancement that suggest inflammation or if their brain lesions are continuing to enlarge despite treatment with steroids, then we might want to think about a tumor. Or when the spinal fluid is not showing inflammation, that might be a red flag. What about the, the antibodies? Well, we just talked about this, that many of these antibodies are a little bit more problematic. And here's some other examples. If they're positive on an immunoblot, which is a special type of technique, only, but not positive on that tissue immunofluorescence, that's a problem. And there's some antibodies like the Casper-2 antibodies where there's low positive results that can be a little bit problematic. Or sometimes laboratories, there's laboratories out there that's set up that are not certified and they can give a lot of positive results that don't mean too much. So what about uh, antibodies that are positive in healthy uh, uh, or disease control? So if we tested everybody in the waiting area in my office here, about 20% of them would have uh, TPO antibodies. Or if we took 50 people or 100 people off the street, 20% of them are going to have um, positive TPO antibodies. And we know that 20% of the population does not have autoimmune encephalitis. And this makes TPO antibodies really a not, not a good marker of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, here at Mayo Clinic, there used to be antibodies on our panel. Some of these, the ganglionic, the striated muscle, the potassium channel complex, and many of these we've removed from our panels because they're not reliable tests and there's too much positivity in the background. So we've removed some of these from our tests. Uh, sometimes the, the level of the antibody positivity, if it's very high positive, for example, with MOG antibodies or GAD65 antibodies, that can be more suggestive, while if it's a very borderline result, sometimes there can be other explanations for that positive result. And sometimes we can dilute. So sometimes when we get the sample in our lab, we can put in extra dilutions to try and get rid of that low positive binding. So we just detect the real cases of autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, this was a study by Dr. Dalmau and colleagues just showing that um, uh, that sometimes if you tested patients with uh, just the immunoblot technique, that would be sometimes problematic. Um, while it's best to use the immunofluorescence technique and the immunoblot as a confirmatory test, not the immunoblot in isolation, because that leads to a lot of false positive results. Um, so we, uh, this study was published in JAMA Neurology for people who want to see this. This is open access, so it's available to all the public. And you can read through the article and kind of get a sense of how these patients presented and what are some of the 
things that we need to look out for to make sure we have a correct uh, diagnosis. And indeed, there was a, a nice editorial from Professor Dalmau and Grouse that talked about misdiagnosis, misconceptions, and how to avoid them. Because at the end of the day, we just want to get the right answer for the patient and get them on the right treatment that they need so they can get back and on with their lives. So, uh, the autoimmune encephalitis has been a real success story, and I don't want to take away from that success because when those antibodies come back positive that are truly the cause, that is really meaningful for patients and so important. On the other hand, if there's a low positive antibody, we do want to make sure that those patients don't get the wrong diagnosis and get the treatment that they need for whatever condition they may have. So in conclusion, we talked today that up to a quarter of patients who were referred to these centers can have uh, autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis, that there was two major categories. We had the neurologic categories like neurodegenerative disorders, brain tumors, and then we had more the non-neurologic uh, falling in the category of psychiatric disorders, functional neurologic disorders, which may fall under the category of neurologic, but a different type of disorder that requires a different treatment. We talked about using these diagnostic criteria to help determine if you do have autoimmune encephalitis. They're quite useful and can at least raise a red flag if you don't. We talked about some of the red flags. If the MRI is completely normal and there's no spinal, there's no inflammation and the antibody, uh, there's no antibody positive or the antibody positive is a little bit of a problematic antibody. As so we talked about the CSF too, spinal fluid, we talked about TPO antibodies being particularly problematic. And then we talked about if you have this enlarging brain lesion, you might want to think about a tumor, or if you've got a lot of thinning and loss of cells within the brain without ever having this inflammation, then that might suggest more of a degenerative type condition like Alzheimer's disease. We talked about that if you do misdiagnosis, that can lead to adverse effects. So patients can have side effects from this. So it's important we get the right diagnosis and that we don't delay the actual diagnosis for these patients. Uh, this is our neuroimmunology lab at the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, Dr. Piddock here, Dr. Lennon, who established the lab, uh, Dr. Lachance, Dr. McKeown, Dr. Dubé, and Dr. Klein, who are all consultants in our lab, and Dr. Zakerdu. And um, I'd like to also thank many of the co-authors who were from many different centers who enrolled patients. And then um, also the University of Vermont, Andrew Solomon, who's an expert in misdiagnosis of multiple sclerosis, helped us out with this study. So um, I'd like to stop there. And I'd like to just say a final thank you to all of the patients and their families out there because these conditions, be it autoimmune encephalitis or one of the mimics that I mentioned, are really, really challenging conditions that can result in very difficult problems of memory loss, seizures, psychiatric difficulties. And we appreciate, we learn every day from our patients. So uh, what I would say is our laboratory is our clinic because that's where we learn from all our patients about um, uh, these conditions and we just want to get the best for the patients. So I appreciate all those patients out there who've been involved in research, who um, come into our clinics, who we learn so much from. So my final thank you is really to the patients and indeed the family members out there because when patients are afflicted with encephalitis or one of these other conditions, oftentimes it's very disabling and they need their caregivers and family members and friends to help them out. And I think many people out there have stepped up to really help. So I'm going to uh, stop there and maybe I'll stop my share and I'll open it up for uh, questions. That's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The first question is, how is the neuronal damage from intracellular AE subtype similar to that of viral encephalitis? It's similar, I would say that's correct in that um, viruses, some of the viruses like the herpes virus can be quite destructive and damage the brain uh, a lot. The viruses tend to come on all of a sudden and then once they're treated um, or your body fights that infection off, it doesn't continue. While with some of these autoimmune encephalitis, it can continue without ongoing treatment. So it tends to be a bit slower and more progressive over time. But those ones with the antibodies to the intracellular targets like anti-HU or ANA1 or Purkinje cell autoantibody type 1, they're quite difficult to treat and don't tend to respond quite as well to the immunotherapy. Right. 
What kind of CSF profile indicates autoimmune rather than infectious origin? Well, I think it's difficult because there's a lot of overlap there. So, you know, what we usually do is we'll test the spinal fluid. And if we see an elevated white blood cell count, for example, or other markers, oligoclonal bands, then we know that there's some inflammation. And that inflammation might either be from an infection or from an autoimmune cause. And the way we discriminate those two is by measuring for the different types of infections. So we'll often test for different viruses, for example, West Nile virus, herpes virus, and we'll also test the antibodies. So if the antibodies in the spinal fluid come back positive and all of the infections are negative, then we know we're dealing with an autoimmune. On the other hand, if all of the antibodies come back negative and we identify a virus, then we're dealing with a viral. But sometimes you can have an autoimmune encephalitis after a virus, which causes even more confusion because sometimes a herpes virus can attack the brain and then there's so much damage and so much inflammation that you get this secondary inflammation. So it's a complicated uh, pathway, uh, but you know, neurology specialists, autoimmune neurologists do see these conditions and can help with the diagnosis. Now, how is uh, FND diagnosed? And I want to kind of go back because in your talk, you were saying 25% end up with mm -hmm. FND with a software problem versus a hardware problem. And I know that that's a wonderful example that you doctors at Mayo use with patients because I've heard it myself before, but it, it fits. So if you could explain a little bit more about that, yeah. that would be wonderful. Yeah, so functional neurologic disorders are, are a challenge because they often don't have much changes on our typical MRI. If you do sophisticated studies, you can see some changes, but this is not under the patient's control. And sometimes it comes on after a stressor or for whatever reason, we don't know why, but patients kind of unlearn how they can do things. So for example, they may have trouble walking. They're not, they've forgotten how to walk. And a lot of the the treatment for these conditions is retraining and training people to get those circuits working again. So we will, you know, have patients march and we'll do lots of different walking techniques to get them back walking, for example, or with cognitive um, dysfunction, we'll do cognitive behavioral therapy where we'll try and re engage those pathways to get those pathways working better so that patients can uh, improve over time. So the, the good thing is that those disorders can improve. There, there's not as much destruction as there is with the infections or as there is with the uh, autoimmune conditions. But in, in saying that, it, they can be very disabling when they happen. So it's very important that we recognize them and get people onto that retraining pathway. And indeed, at Mayo Clinic, we have a program and other centers do where we will retrain a patient to walk for a week. And sometimes the patients go in in a wheelchair and they can come out on the last day walking normally. So there can be really dramatic responses to treatment with those conditions too. So important to recognize a different treatment pathway. They can be very disabling and you know they're, they're, um, they're quite difficult uh, for patients and patients have no control over them, but there are ways that we can help them, which is good. I know it's really challenging that the, the rehabilitation for the patient is mm -hmm. very challenging. So um, it, it, that's a tough, that's a tough road too. Um, then is immunosuppression necessary for AE recovery said differently? Could a person who fits the AE criteria, uh, but without CSF antibodies still have AE if immunosuppression isn't given? So that can happen, yes. So some patients can improve. Your body can spontaneously resolve. For example, with the MOG antibodies, we've had some patients who developed confusion. People looked and thought it was an infection, gave them antibiotics, and they got better on their own. So sometimes the body can heal from these, but really the immunotherapy can prevent some of that long-term damage. So it's important if you do have autoimmune encephalitis that you get in and you do um, treat with these types of treatments, which might be steroids or plasma exchange or IVIG, because, you know, um, while some of them can improve on their own, others don't improve on their own and they can do a lot of damage and cause, you know, brain damage that can be permanent. So we do like to get in with treatment, but it is possible for some patients to recover spontaneously, but I would say that's the minority. <clears throat> that's, that's what I was waiting for you to say, because 
what percentage would you put on that? It's not very. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, 5% or less, maybe less. Than I think 10%. that's important for people to hear. Thank you. you know, so yeah. you don't want to take the chance of, of not getting a treatment if you, if you think you've autoimmune. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and some people are, uh, when they first get a diagnosis, they're concerned about the side effects of the immunotherapy that we're talking yeah. about. Parents suffer through this because they have to make the decision. Spouses can also have a difficult time with it thinking, am I making the right decision with these side effects? And and as advocates with our organization, we let them know you're worried about the wrong thing. <laughs> yep. yep. Worry about the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't yeah. worry about the side effects here. We're talking about your brain. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, and sometimes, for example, with the LGI-1 antibodies, we sometimes have to use steroids for a long period of time because it really steroids is the best treatment by far. But, you know, that can prevent a patient from getting uh, severe cognitive issues, long-term brain damage. So it can be really important. So that's a good point. The other point to say is that, you know, we don't want to give long-term immunotherapy if the diagnosis is not right. So you want to make sure, but once you're sure of the diagnosis, the immunotherapy is important and the earlier, the better. So we want to get that started. And sometimes we'll even start it without knowing for sure, just to get it up front because we don't want to miss it. Right. So here's a question about disability and death statistics differing uh, autoimmune encephalitis compared to mimicking diseases. Is AE generally more deadly and or disabling? That's an awfully wide question. <laughs> yes, it, it, it depends on the conditions. So I suppose, right. you know, for some of the neurodegenerative conditions like CJD, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or Alzheimer's, some of those are worse than autoimmune encephalitis. On the other hand, functional neurologic disorders where there's not as much brain tissue damage can have a better outcome in the long term or psychiatric disorders with uh, psychiatric medications can get better and there's not as, as much destruction. So it depends on which one. So some of them are worse, some of them are better. And then this is a follow-up for an FND question. Is the diagnosis one of exclusion or inclusion? I think it's a combination of both. You know, as neurologists, we have to use our history taking skills, our examination skills, and then, you know, we do investigations. So, you know, in some patients, it's not clear what the diagnosis is, and we have to do a broad workup and then come to that conclusion. In other patients, um, you know, it's clear what the diagnosis is, and we can make that diagnosis on clinical grounds. So, uh, but it's very important to know that that functional neurologic disorders can be very disabling and can leave a patient in a wheelchair or cognitively impaired. But the good news is that there's less destruction. So there's a potential if we do that retraining for a good recovery. How many of your misdiagnosed patients actually had infectious encephalitis? Did you actually keep a tally on that? Uh, I think it was maybe uh, four or five. There was just a few. Um, we, we mostly took patients uh, who had been seen in an outpatient clinic. So we may have missed mm. some of the patients who were seen in hospital because infections are more often seen in hospital. But there were some patients uh, who had HIV infection or who had other viral infections that uh, were not autoimmune. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen antibody titers get higher over time and then begin to indicate neurological involvement? Yeah, I would say that the titers are, you know, the titers aren't as useful to follow as the patient. So because the titers can sometimes go up and down a bit. Um, but we do sometimes see where a patient was in remission for many years and the antibody went away and then it might come back if they had a relapse. But most of the time we follow the patient. And if the patient's having new seizures or new encephalitis, then we get more worried about that than we do about the titers because the titers vary a bit. They're not as kind of useful to follow. Um, but we can sometimes see them go higher in the setting of a relapse. So it can happen, but not as useful to follow as how the patient is doing themselves. And you just touched on a question someone wrote me about this morning. Um, uh, she was asking... How do doctors, and it's interesting, she's in another country in Europe, and she's uh, with a nonprofit there, and she said, how do doctors confirm a relapse? Because 
this um, conversation around titers and how yeah. how high titers are is what's revolving around the conversation where she's uh, seeing advocacy yeah. done. Yeah. So I think what you want to do is you repeat the tests when a patient has a relapse. So you'll repeat your MRI, your EEG, and your spinal fluid and the antibodies. And if the spinal fluid is showing inflammation, the brain is showing inflammation, and the antibodies are still present, be it at a higher or lower titer, if you're finding evidence of inflammation at that time and the patient is having symptoms, then you know you're in a relapse. So we use the same things that we use up front again. So we often repeat all those tests and we don't just rely on one because in some patients, the antibody um, you know, will stay for a long time. And if the antibody's there, but if they have influenza or they have other, they have COVID or something else that can cause them, because the brain can sometimes be a little bit of a weak spot. So if you get an infection or something else that can make you think like you have a, a recurrence of the symptoms, but actually it's because you have an underlying infection in your body and that can, you know, cause the brain you to become a bit more confused, just like any patient, an elderly patient who gets a urine infection, lots of times they can get confused, for example. I'm so glad you brought that up because we get that question all the time where uh, somebody will get a flu or a cold and they yeah. feel much more symptomatic and they, and and their question is, am I in a flare or is this a relapse? And why is this happening? Can you yeah. explain what actually yeah. happens? Yeah, well, this is it's something we call a pseudo relapse, and we see that in in multiple sclerosis also. And the bottom line is that what you need to do in that situation, we always check and make sure that there's not active inflammation. But if we don't see active inflammation on our MRI or a spinal fluid, then we'll often treat those. We need to treat the underlying disease. Uh, the so if it's a uh, urine infection, influenza, we need to give them the treatment for that. And then usually the patients will recover back to normal. So the brain is a bit of a weak spot, just as if you have a sore knee and then, you know, you get a flu-like illness, your, your knee's probably going to be sore than the rest of your body kind of thing. So it, it happens all throughout the body. Yeah. Um, here's a question about MOG antibody. When would, uh, when should a MOG antibody be obtained in the workup for MS? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we have to be a little bit careful with the mock antibody because it's a little bit, the test is a little bit sticky. So sometimes, uh, this is the way I put it, so sometimes uh, people who don't have the true mock antibody disease can have some low positive results. So in general, if the case looks classic for MS with all of the features of MS. Sometimes we don't recommend to test people for MOG antibodies in that situation because um, if you test them all, you'll find some low positives that don't, aren't really truly the MOG antibody disease because MS is a good bit more common than actually the MOG antibody disease. But early on, when if you're not really sure and there are changes or if it's a pediatric patient, then you really want to test MOG antibodies because MOG is very, very common in children. So I think it, it, early on, if you're not sure or if there's some atypical features for MS, but if everything looks classic for MS and all of the findings are really characteristic, Characteristic, then we don't recommend testing the MOG antibody because um, we have some trouble with low positive results. Now, here's a common question with low levels of GAD65, because patients will hear they're positive for GAD and yeah. there's a laundry list of things that can represent. Um, what are some of the other explanations for low positive results? Uh, so I would say the most common is diabetes. So mm -hmm. we see this in, in people with autoimmune diabetes. They often have GAD as a marker of uh, autoimmune diabetes. Or just in general, people who are a bit prone to autoimmunity, like um, if they have rheumatoid arthritis or thyroid disease, sometimes they'll have some low positive GAD65 antibodies. The other time we sometimes see positive results is if a patient has been given IVIG. IVIG mm. are pooled antibodies from the general population. And if we put that into someone's blood and then we test their blood the next day, we might find some antibodies. If there was a diabetic who donated blood and antibodies, we can sometimes pick them up. So you got to be a little bit careful if you've just received the IVIG, if you find um, positive antibody result. What kind of a leeway do you like to give in a situation like that if a patient has had IVIG before you would test? 
Yeah, I think it's still probably okay to test if you need to get the test result. It doesn't cause as much of a problem, but you might want to wait, wait six to 12 weeks. The other problem we see sometimes is if people have had plasma exchange, which removes all of your antibodies. If we test you the week after plasma exchange, you'll have no antibodies. So, um, so we usually definitely will wait three months or so after plasma exchange. With IVIG, it's probably still okay because if there's a high positive antibody, we'll probably still pick it up. With the plasma exchange, it's a problem. So if you're negative, for example, but the doctor tested you after the plasma exchange, like we talked about antibody negative encephalitis, you want to repeat the test down the line. And here's a good general question. Can you comment on special considerations when diagnosing a case of seronegative AE? Yeah, I think that's the scenario uh, we talked about earlier that did they, are we sure they tested the spinal fluid as well as the blood? Because zero refers to blood. So, but if you are antibody negative in the blood and spinal fluid, then you want to talk to your doctor and say, well, are we sure that this is not something else? So you want to think about a broad categories of all of the other conditions that this could be, because we don't want to put people on long-term immune lowering therapy if there's a different diagnosis. So this will be the time when maybe the doctor takes out our research article and looks through and says, you know, is it definitely negative? Have we ruled out all these other things? And you kind of want to think broadly and use your clinical judgment and clinical acumen. As a neurologist, we have to be able to use our judgment as what's truly autoimmune and what is not. Well, here's here's someone who's going to sneak in a, a question generally, and I know who this is, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with any patients where prostate cancer caused LGI-1? Um, I have not seen that association, but we know that um, that LGI-1 antibody doesn't associate with cancer very often, about 10% or less. And what I would say is that that could be um, uh, kind of a, a coincidence because the LGI-1 antibodies tend to happen in older males and older males tend to get prostate cancer. So they may not necessarily be related. Um, so they may be two separate things because the main tumor that we see with LGI-1 that we think is associated with it is a thymic tumor, a tumor of a gland in your neck called a thymoma. So I would say that most likely most cases of uh, prostate cancer and the LGA1 antibodies are probably not related, but you never know, there could be a possibility, but because they both happen in older men, uh, it may be a coincidence. That's a really interesting uh, aspect that I hadn't thought of, because when you do look up what are the cancer associations, it's not one of them. Yes. So, that, so, so then you would likely then not consider that a perineoplastic case? No, we may not. We may think of it as being related. On the other hand, if you had a smoker and they had a small cell lung cancer and they had a different antibody like GABA-B, then we would say, even though you're old and we know that older people can get the small cell lung cancer, we know strongly often leads to an autoimmune or perineoplastic condition. So it depends on what type of cancer. But we, for example, we know that people can get skin cancers, just a, you know, a basal cell cancer on their face. And lots of those are not associated with uh, the underlying autoimmune conditions. That's good to know. Is brainstem involvement relatively rare in AE? Where would you place that? Eh, I would say it, it does happen, probably maybe 20% or so. It depends on the antibodies. So for example, with MOG antibodies or with aquaporin 4 antibodies, patients can have brainstem involvement. Um, and with some of the other antibodies, there's one called MA2 antibodies. So it depends a little bit on the antibody, but brainstem involvement can happen. So if you do have those symptoms, it is important that your doctor test you for these antibodies and consider the possibility of an autoimmune encephalitis. Okay, um, here's one about a, a paper Dr. Harniot's group in France recently published a paper on Casper 2 encephalitis, early stage uh, Casper 2 limbic encephalitis, which highlighted that this subtype often doesn't meet 2016 Grouse criteria. Yes. Do you think there are other antibodies yet to be discovered which don't fit Grouse uh, Delmo criteria and who would be at risk of being misdiagnosed with a non-neurologic -neur condition like FND 
as a primary psychiatric yeah. issue. Uh, that's an excellent point. And I will say that these criteria, although I, I highlighted it in my note, is it's a red flag. So if you don't meet the criteria to red flag, that doesn't mean that it's not possible to have autoimmune encephalitis. There are always exceptions. And I think future iterations of the criteria need to figure out how they can pull in those cases. Because we see this similar with LGI-1 antibodies where they may not fulfill the criteria or Casper-2 antibodies. So you got to be, um, there are cases that won't fulfill the criteria, but you got to be careful. So in that situation, your doctor needs to consider other possibilities too, but then you still can make the diagnosis if you have a strongly positive antibody and everything else fits. But that might be a situation if you don't meet the criteria where the doctor thinks outside the box and make sure that they've covered other bases because we don't want to uh, uh, misdiagnose either. And we have someone who's just thanking you for such an outstanding presentation. Oh, That's very <laughs> nice. Um, here's a question about, I think, seizures. Which AE causes seizures? Now, how are these diagnosed if the EEG is sometimes normal? I think catching those seizures can be uh, tricky. Yes, so sometimes that's correct. So the LGI-1 antibody is the big one, and it's something called facio-brachial dystonic seizures. They're kind of an unusual seizure type. They sometimes cause twisting up of the face, so the, the face might twist to one side, or the arm might twist a little bit. And sometimes people will drop things from their hand or their leg might kick out. And they often happen up to 100 times a day. And um, these can be difficult to diagnose. Um, but if if, um, if doctors are out there, if you look up a video, you'll find videos online from publications. They look very similar case to case. And sometimes the EEG is not normal. So it's important for doctors to recognize this LGI-1 antibody encephalitis and these facial brachial dystonic seizures, because some of those have gotten misdiagnosed the other way around, where the people are told these are functional or these are not autoimmune, Ooh. and they are actually autoimmune. So we have to be a little bit careful. But those episodes um, are very characteristic. And if you test for the LGI-1 antibodies, they will be positive. So they're the main seizure group that I would focus in on that neurologists and doctors need to be better aware of. And that's why we often give talks out there at the American Academy of Neurology every year or other places to try and educate doctors about these. But that's a good point that these can- And, uh, and that particular good. seizure, mm -hmm. if it's recognized, this is like red alert, everybody, all you clinicians out there, recognizing that seizure, because if you recognize it right away, and then find out, yes, this is LGI-1. Can't Isn't it so that research has now shown that you can prevent the disease from progressing yeah. Yeah. through? Exactly. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you can prevent them developing cognitive impairment or dementia. So um, it's really important to get in early. And what happens is they don't respond to seizure medications. They respond to steroids. So if you give a patient a week of steroids with that condition, with those facial brachial dystonic seizures, they'll often all melt away within that week. So they're very responsive to the steroids, but you could try anti-epileptics and it won't often work. So it's really important to to watch out for that. Yeah. Excellent yeah. point. Um that's a that's a huge big one that we're we're really wanting clinicians to understand and patients too. You simply never know uh, when you might see it. So recognizing it is really important. What are the risks or co consequences of being misdiagnosed with a psychiatric disorder or FND disorder when it's actually AE? Yeah. Uh, we touched on that a little bit with these LGI-1 antibodies. That can happen. It wasn't the focus of our study. We usually see it more commonly the other way around. But I will say that that is a problem because if it is true autoimmune encephalitis, then um, you know it needs to be treated as such. So we have to be careful and that can lead to delay in diagnosis and damage. So the other way around can happen and is also a problem. So it is very important that we educate doctors. But we have done... A better and better job. Doctors are looking out for these conditions more and more, particularly from uh, groups like uh, the society here and, you know, um, uh, uh, patients who've written stories, written books, movies, that helps people recognize these conditions. Um, you mentioned, you were mentioning um, N and PQ type antibodies that they were yeah. removed from the panel. 
So um, can, can you just repeat why that was that you removed them? Yep. So for encephalitis, the PQ antibodies are a marker of something called Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which is a separate autoimmune condition that affects the muscle and the nerve and the nerve muscle junction, but it doesn't really cause encephalitis. So we now at Mayo Clinic have our panels divided up into what the syndrome is. So the patient is presenting with encephalitis or myelitis or a movement problem or a nerve problem or a muscle problem. And because the PQ antibodies don't associate with an encephalitis, we removed it from our panel because some of these antibodies can be positive in 3% of the population in general. So then we, it leads to a lot of misdiagnoses. So we've had to get better tests onto our panel and the ones that are more sticky or more problematic we've removed. And doesn't that also help the patients so that they don't fall through the cracks too or and are more accurately diagnosed? It does, yeah, because each time we remove one and many other laboratories are doing this too, we're adding new ones that are better. For example, the Kelsch-like 11 antibodies, a new one that's been discovered recently, a marker of encephalitis that is much more reliable. So we're trying to remove the ones that are less reliable and focus on the ones that are more reliable. Right. Um, let's take one more question because we're right right at the hour. Um, I guess we have some LGI1 questions. Uh, one, I wonder if we can combine something. Uh, how is LGI1 treated and how long do you use steroids for LGI1 uh, dosing recommendations? Yes, so for LGI1 antibody encephalitis, we'll often use steroids are the best treatment. And what I found is that we generally use high dose IV steroids for a patient in the hospital. So it might be one gram of IV methylprednisolone once daily for five days. And then we often put them on oral steroids for maybe even many months, for a few months, a high dose oral, and then slowly tapered over many months after that. And that tends to really take care of the LGI-1 antibody encephalitis. So we tend to use that. Sometimes we'll also use other treatments, what we call steroid sparing treatments like rituximab or mycophenolate. But the steroids are really the best treatment there. And we've had patients where they only got a quick burst of steroids and they got, didn't get any oral steroids. And many of those patients have a quick recurrence. So longer term uh, oral steroids. Um, and I'm just trying to see if there's anything else I could touch on. Um, Does it have to do with the timing of the diagnosis? I'm wondering if that's more true if it's recognized early versus... Yeah, or if it's recognized it's, late, it can be it can be harder to to diagnose and treat. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I I've I'm aware of cases where uh, clinicians think, "Gosh, this looks like dementia." Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think what I'll say is that uh, just as a, a final message to people, I said I'll say because I know there's lots of messages in here. It, it's really important to diagnose autoimmune encephalitis, and we don't want it to happen that those patients are misdiagnosed. On the other hand, it's also important to recognize the cases that are not autoimmune encephalitis and to treat those as their particular conditions. So there's both sides of the equation here. And the bottom line is we in neurology do not want any patient. I don't want one patient misdiagnosed. So we just want to get the patient on the right treatment. But much of the studies before this one had previously focused on those patients who were missed. And we wanted just to bring it back that there are some patients that who have alternative causes that uh, can be misdiagnosed as autoimmune encephalitis. So it's a, certainly a balance of both ways. I think we've had great success in the field of autoimmune encephalitis. It's brilliant that we have all these antibodies and we're trying to, they're getting better and better all the time. The testing is getting better. So we're hopeful that there'll be less confusion down the line. But the bottom line is we just want to get the best for our patients and we never want any patient to be misdiagnosed. And that's the number one focus of my practice at the Mayo Clinic and for many neurologists is getting the right diagnosis and getting the patient on the right treatment and trying to help the patient as best as we can. So I think there's a balance there both ways. And I know many in the audience may have had there there is misdiagnosed and, and that's a sad situation either way, whether it's you're given a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis incorrectly or it was missed and you're told you had something else and you truly had autoimmune encephalitis. 
And we echo the same thing. It's about an accurate diagnosis. Exactly right. Yeah. Because once you have an accurate diagnosis, you have an accurate treatment plan and best outcome. So exactly, yeah. the, our question that we get so often is, my loved one has all of the symptoms of autoimmune encephalitis. Does that mean they have autoimmune encephalitis? And we give them a resounding no. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, we need to. We need to be sure. So we need but to we do need, the test. We and, will yeah. help you get to yeah. a, vision, uh, a clinician who will come up with the accurate answer. So we always tell people keep an open mind. We don't exactly know right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we do know is that you need help and an accurate diagnosis so yeah that's what absolutely it is true. all about yes absolutely true yeah we appreciate all of the work that you and your colleagues do at the mayo clinic um you are our our heroes <laughs> <laughs> you have a you have a fan base out here in in patient and uh with patients and families because um you you take care of us you mm -hmm. save our lives, you get us back on track and allow us to take our lives back and reclaim mm -hmm. our lives. Well, I, we are forever grateful, Owen. Thank you so much for the time you've given us today. Yeah, and then thank you so much. And really, you know, the patients out there and their caregivers are the real heroes. So we, we just want to help, you know, that's kind of our duty. So, but it's a real pleasure to be able to answer some questions here. And I'm happy to, if there's more questions left over, feel free to share them with me and we can get any other additional questions answered. Um, okay, thank you. So, we really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks again. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And have a wonderful Valentine's Day tomorrow and the rest of your AE Awareness Month. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.